Okay, well, hello, everybody. Welcome to this Nehemiah Bible study. Thank you for joining us today. We're going to be looking at Nehemiah chapter 10, continuing on our series, working through the book of Nehemiah one chapter at a time. And we're hoping this is really going to enrich your personal study of the book of Nehemiah. We're going to uh, ch just uh, pick out a few verses from Nehemiah chapter 10 today, and then we're going to have a discussion about the key themes. So let's go ahead and begin by reading verses 20 to 29 and then verses 37 to 39. The rest of the people, priests, Levites, gatekeepers, musicians, temple servants, and all who separated themselves from the neighboring peoples for the sake of the law of God, together with their wives and all their sons and daughters who are able to understand, all these now join their fellow Israelites and nobles and bind themselves with a curse and an oath to follow the law of God given through Moses, the servant of God, and to obey carefully all the commands and regulations and decrees of the Lord our God. And then we'll jump down to verses 37 to 39. Moreover, we will bring to the storerooms of the house of our God to the priests, the first of our ground meal of our grain offerings, of the fruit of all our trees and of our new wine and olive oil. And we will bring a tithe of our crops to the Levites, for it is the Levites who collect the tithes in all the towns where we work. A priest descending from Aaron is to accompany the Levites when they receive the tithes, and the Levites are to bring a tenth of the tithes up to the house of God, to the storerooms of the treasury. The people of Israel, including the Levites, are to bring their contributions of grain, new wine, and olive oil to the storerooms where the articles for the sanctuary and for the ministering priests, the gatekeepers, and the musicians are also kept we will not neglect the house of our God. So a lot of detail there. And just by brief summary of the book of Nehemiah, the early chapters deal with the rebuilding of the walls of the city. Following that, uh, they have a bit of a worship service. They um, have public reading of the word of God. And then there's a bit of a song that the Levites, the re religious leaders there that lead them in a bit of confession uh, to God of their wrongdoings and thanking God for his faithfulness. And we're now in this point, which begins in the very end of chapter nine, where it mm. says that the people made a binding agreement mm. with God. And so Dr. John, could you just, uh, uh, elaborate for us what has led to this point why are the people making this binding agreement who's it applying to right the uh, binding agreement involved the people really making several promises to god and what had happened uh, is they reflected back on how good god had been to them in the past all the blessings and how he looked after them and guided them and provided for them but also they reflected on how they and also the people of Israel in the past had rejected God, turned away from God, disobeyed his commandments. And they were really repenting. They were sorry for what they'd done and they wanted to turn around and follow the Lord their God. And in doing that, they wanted to make a formal agreement to say, you know, this is what we're going to do. We're going to obey all your, your rules, uh, all your laws. We're going to serve you faithfully and, mm -hmm. and fully. Uh, and so that's um, the people were doing that as a, as a kind of outward decoration of their intent of their hearts. Right. Mm. So it's almost like it. And even in the previous chapter, they've been re they've been remembering the goodness of God and all the yeah. ways that they've fallen short. And this is mm. almost like a time to, to time to do better sort of thing, mm. isn't it, Amy? Absolutely. Yeah. And, and we also see within this, we see who sorts of puts their their name down for this covenant as well. Right. And we see there's 84 of their leaders. So we've got uh, the Levites who are sort of like the religious leaders. And then we've also got the civic leaders as well. And they come forward, they put their name on the line mm. for the covenant before God. But then after that, we see, you know, quite a few of the people as well, mm. the people of Jerusalem come forward, um, you know, the people who've got knowledge and understanding of what's happening. Mm. And they also want to put their name forward for the mm. covenant. And uh, this is really interesting. Uh, covenant is basically sort of like an agreement. Mm -hmm. And um, they accept that if they stray away, if they start to disobey God, that they're accepting a curse, mm -hmm. which is an interesting form of language that it's not really mm -hmm. something that we often talk about nowadays. Um, but essentially what they're agreeing to, that if they, if they disobey, they're agreeing to the consequences right. of that. So it's mm -hmm. not, you know, this... Um, 
often, I guess I think we have some interesting assumptions about curses, but essentially what they're agreeing to mm. is uh, the consequences to their actions, whatever that may be. Yeah, it's not really spooky in a sense. Is mm. it? it's, it's, it's not that sort of thing. If we were to reword it, it would be more like, okay, we're going to follow God and his word. And if we, mm-hmm. and if we follow through on that and we do it, then may it go well for us. Yeah. And if it doesn't, may we face the consequences yeah. in a sense is what they're saying and yeah it's interesting isn't it they've got the their key leaders signing uh, and you know uh, sealing this agreement mm. uh, but then as you say it's you know all who are able to understand it's almost on behalf of mm-hmm. on behalf of the whole people isn't it and and you know laulu uh, this is quite a statement that the people are making here you know that it's a binding agreement this isn't just an offhand remark or a spur of the moment thing but this is a uh, a serious commitment mm. and so what is it that has led the people to have this motivation absolutely i mean we see that this comes off the back of the um completion of the wars that was led um, by nehemiah himself and of course after you know the completion of the wars as you mentioned earlier pastor Jonah, you know we um we see that the people have a time of prayer and worship they have a time um, you know of reading of the word and basically after all of this the people were so convicted they were like mm. wow like our like our people like our ancestors like they have sinned against god really badly and and we have sinned against god as well and actually they you know they they see this and they don't just use this as a guilt trip for them for themselves and do nothing about it but actually they are so convicted and now they are now thinking you know it's it's, it's time to do what's right you know it's, mm. it's, it's time to live as God's people, because actually these were God's chosen people. Yeah. And, uh, you know, to see, you know, in, in um, the history and their past of, mm. you know, seeing their people, you know, go away from God and seeing their people desert God and seeing their people really disrespect God. And, um, you know, them not realizing, actually, this isn't how God has called us to live. Mm. And, you know, they are now convicted of their sins. And now they have this new energy. They are now revitalized to follow strictly in the ways of the Lord. And, really to to, mm. to do what, what what is right because it's, you know this is the same god who you know pulled them out of cap- um, captivity you know mm. this is the same god who has you know helped them in all of their battles you know in you know mm. in their journey to, to the to the promised land and now they are thinking well how you know how dare we not follow in the ways of, you know of, of of this god and mm-hmm. you know now they are now um yeah really have a fresh motivation as you say to follow in the ways of the lord and to really keep all of his commandments mm. Mm, yeah it's such a great point as well and just leading off of what laulu had said you know in chapter eight that's when they really um we start to see that change happen mm. isn't it you know that they're, they're hearing you know uh, the history and what everything yeah. that god has done for them they're they're reading the the law of the book of moses and that's when as laulu said they're really starting to to mm. see in being convicted over you know uh, wrongdoings of their ancestors but also they start to see where they've you know fallen short as well and right. it's, it's through the hearing of the word of god and in mm. romans 10 17 says so then faith comes by hearing mm. yes. and hearing by the word of god and that's what happens when we when we read the bible and we, and we really mm. lean into what god's saying in the bible is that actually we become i guess convicted of, of our shortcomings and mm. we realize how much we are reliant mm. on god's goodness and his graciousness mm. yeah. Yeah, it's really interesting. And, it, and and on top of that, it's interesting that, you know, during that previous chapter, there's a big emphasis on not only where they've fallen short, but they say you have been faithful mm. to God and yeah. they acknowledge time and time again, God's mercy and his compassion. And there's that verse in the Bible that says God's mercy leads to repentance. Yeah. And yeah. so it's almost here where yeah. say they've acknowledged God's mercy and now it's like, okay, that's going to change how we yeah. act. In a sense, it's similar to our lives as Christians, isn't it? You know, mm. the, the way that we live today, it is, uh, you know, to come out of a recognition of God's l- mercy and love for us. Yeah. Interesting parallel there. Mm. Uh, and so uh, Dr. John, this binding agreement then, what does it include? The main points of the agreement were to obey God's laws and commands. Everything that they did, God had told them to do. So not a case of just picking and choosing, oh, I like this, but I don't want that. But all the, the, the laws, the commands, which God had, had put there for, for a reason, for, to, uh, to, to guide them, to make sure that they did what he wanted them to do for their own, for their own good. And so, you know, God's a, a loving God. And so they, they said, right, we're going to obey those. Mm. Because in the mm-hmm. past... The, the, the people of Israel had strayed away from God and not mm. obeyed his commandments. Mm. Um, 
also not to intermarry with pagan nations. Mm. Now, that's not saying that God is not against the foreign nation as such. Mm. In fact, it says in, in Deuteronomy to, to welcome the foreigner, the right. stranger. Right. But the problem here was these nations were had uh, pagan gods, false gods, and they had abominable practices associated with mm. the worship of these gods. Mm. And if they were to marry into the, those um, nations, they would be likely to be drawn away from God. Mm. It yeah. happened with King Solomon. Same type of thing. Yeah. He married uh, into uh, wives from a, a, a pagan nation. Mm -hmm. And it ended up where he was worshipping. He turned away from God. Mm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and so he's saying, you know, don't do that because you will be drawn away mm. um, from God the true God and mm. um, also not to buy and sell on the Sabbath day to keep that day holy yeah. mm. and another interesting one every seven years to mm. cancel debts mm. and also to let the land rest so they wouldn't be mm. uh, sowing crops and stuff in in that, that piece of land on that time to give it mm. time to to recuperate as it were mm. and also the final thing is to give to the house of God and also to the work of God mm. Mm. That's brilliant. Thank you for that summary, Dr. Sean. That's really helpful. And uh, just to add on to that, you know, it's interesting, you know, they talk about they will follow, you know, the law of Moses and then they just highlight those key specific areas. One commentator said it's uh, it's like they're acknowledging God as Lord in their relationships. That's the rela uh, that's their hint of marriage uh, in time to the Sabbath mm. and in possessions mm. in their giving. And I mean, mm. uh, we could all do the same today, couldn't we? Mm. Amy, the most detailed section in this binding agreement is reserved for explaining the practice of mm. tithing. Yeah. So uh, what exactly is a tithe? It's something that's still mm. around in, uh, you know, Christians practicing that today. Mm. Um, so what exactly is a tithe and why was it so significant to these people at this time? Mm. So a tithe is when we give 10% of our income to, into God's house and into the work of God and this is this is super important because firstly it's you know um contributing to, to what God is doing and giving God I guess the, the first of our income it's that sort mm -hmm. of giving God our best um but I think it's really important as well because greed materialism it's really easy for these things to sort of seep into our hearts and right. if we you know choose to stop tithing if we compromise on that we can see that we end up compromising on lots of other parts of our faith mm -hmm. as well and so Tithing really helps us to keep a healthy relationship with money and actually putting our faith in God mm. rather than in finances. Um, but if we look at specifically at this time, you know, Jerusalem's temple stood at the heart of people's spiritual, political, right. moral life. So if the, if the temple was maintained mm. and the people, you know, chose to invest into it and chose to, to, to tithe, mm. actually, and they were kept accountable to that, it was going to be more likely that the people were, were going to stay obedient to God mm. as well. Yes, mm. yeah, no, absolutely. And actually tithing, you know, as you said, it was so important. It was, it was a principle that stated that actually like, I trust God more than my finances. You mm. know, I, I trust God more than the things I do. I mean, we see again in this time um, of Nehemiah that actually the, you know, giving away your firstborn and your first fruits, um, which was one of the ways that, you know, they tithed as well. You know, this was quite a risky way to give because, you know, in the, I guess, like logic sense, uh, your land after this might not, you know, yield, you know, much more produce or, you know, your um, your animals like your cows or your ewes, you know, might not, um, you know, give birth again. And actually, you know, this was, you know, in the logical sense, not something that you would do, but actually when you add faith to it, you know, it spins, you know, the narrative. Mm. And um, mm. when you actually realize that the first doesn't belong to us, but the first belongs to God, mm. you know, that's what these people then realize. And that's why, you know, this principle of tithing is so, so important. You know, it says in uh, Proverbs, you know, chapter three from verses nine to 10, to honor the Lord with your possessions and with mm. the first fruits of your increase so that your barns, you know, will be filled with plenty and your vats will overflow with new wine. And, you mm. know, this was a principle that, you know, was followed, you know, by these people, you know, in this time. It wasn't a logical thing to do, but actually they, they saw that when they tithed, that when they actually, you know, gave their first to God, you know, God promised to bless this giving of their first fruits and firstborn in faith. And actually that's what God um, exactly did. So actually God, you know, blessed his people. He didn't just tell them to do something and, and he 
he, did, he didn't just leave them on their own, but actually he, you know, came through on, on his promise to, to these people mm-hmm. in this time. And um, yeah, that's why it was so important for them to, you know, um, I guess the, the principle is, is the important thing to actually put God first over your finances and over every, every, every other thing in your life. You talk about it not being a logical uh, thing to do. And that's a really interesting point, isn't it? Because we've got to remember the context of this book is that the people, they've not long been returned to the city of Jerusalem, which was in ruins. Mm. And they've built up the walls and the work of, um, you know, uh, building up the city itself is still underway. And Mm. you think of people themselves, you know, that they're individually, you could think, wanting to be saving every penny. Uh, but then almost the the tithe and the way that this whole binding agreement is set up is that there is a sense of, okay, yes, you know, we need to take care of ourselves, but actually as well, we want to take care of the house of God. Yeah. Yeah. That principle at the end, you know, where it says we will not neglect the house of our yeah. God. It's one that it's, it's affirmed not just here, but in, you know, you think of the timeline of the Old Testament. We mentioned before that the prophet mm-hmm. Haggai was around at the same kind of time. And he brought a really challenging message on this too, saying to people, your own houses are great, mm-hmm. but the house of the Lord lies in ruins. What yeah. are you doing? That there is a sense of, as you've identified, putting uh, God first mm-hmm. there. Um so, uh, Dr. John, you know, I suppose when it comes to tithing, it is a practice that many Christians will practice today. Uh, but then when you look at the Old Testament practices, even the practices outlined in this chapter of Nehemiah, there's plenty of practices that we won't do today as well. And so are there any principles that people can use when reading the Bible, especially the Old Testament, to help them identify what we should bring forward to today and what maybe we can leave? I think the thing is with, uh, with um, Jesus said, I've come to not do away with the law, but to fulfill it. Mm-hmm. Right. And so Jesus has fulfilled. Say, for example, we don't need to do animal sacrifices because they were symbolic of the mm-hmm. sacrifice of Christ on the cross. Mm-hmm. So his sacrifice is complete and all sufficient. Mm-hmm. Um, also, and Jesus said that all the law and the prophets is summed up in the commandments, love God with all your soul, mm-hmm. might, uh, and all your mind and all your strength, and to love your, your neighbor as yourself. Right. And so there's that, uh, in a sense, uh, uh, the law of love, as it were. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and, you know, Jesus will, um, when we're looking at uh, tithing, mm-hmm. um, tithing is still relevant for Christians for a, a number of reasons. Mm-hmm. And I think the, the well, first one we'll look at is tithing was initiated long before Moses gave the law. Right. Mm. Uh, we go back into the book of Genesis in chapter 14. We read that Abram, who was later called Abraham, mm. gave, gave Melchizedek, the king of Salem, one-tenth of what he possessed. Now, Bible scholars think that Melchizedek was an appearance of Jesus before he was born and uh, took on flesh uh, in, in Bethlehem. Mm-hmm. Uh, but there, there's a principle of tithing, and that's a long time before, before the law. Mm-hmm. And this is uh, picked up by the writer to the Hebrews in chapter 7. Mm-hmm. So yes, we are under grace, not under the law, but this principle uh, of tithing will still apl- apply. Mm. Uh, also, Jesus didn't condemn the Pharisees for tithing. I mean, the, the Pharisees right. were, saying, were tithing all the, um, the mint and everything, you know, yeah. the, uh, mm. uh, all the things that they grew, everything was tithe. They said, oh, aren't I so good? Mm. Um, but Jesus was saying, you miss out. You don't practice justice, mercy, and faithfulness. So mm. he told them to practice those things, mm. but not to neglect the other things. In other words, tithing. In other words, Jesus is saying, mm. uh, have justice, mercy, and faithfulness, but don't yeah. stop your tithing. Yeah. So yeah. Jesus is teaching there. Mm. Uh, and uh, finally, Paul writes to the Corinthians, Second Corinthians uh, chapter 9, God loves a cheerful giver. Mm. Now, generosity is a key value of the kingdom of God. Mm. So really, why wouldn't we want to give generously mm. to our generous yeah. God? Right. And it's interesting, the word, Greek word which we translate cheerful is hilaron, mm. from which we get the word hilarious. Mm. Oh. Uh, and so really, God loves an hilarious giver. Mm. So you're kind of a stingy giver. Well, they want to give as little as they possibly can. Yeah. 
but hilarious giver yeah. wants to give as much as they can. Mm. And the question asks, we could ask is, are you a stingy or are you a hilarious mm. giver? Mm. Mm. That's a really helpful way of looking at things, isn't it? And uh, and specifically with relating to tithing, it really shows that it is something that is still a good practice for Christians mm. today. But just to tease out um, two principles that you mentioned, which people can use when reading the Old Testament for mm. themselves is number one, having a look at what do the New Testament letters say about it? Yeah. You know, what do they say about this principle? You mentioned the, I think it's t- uh, two Corinthians verse about God loves a cheerful yeah. giver. And I mean, throughout the whole New Testament, generosity is so, mm. it's such a key value, isn't it? But then also, mm. so, so what does the New Testament say about this principle? And then secondly, what does Jesus say about this mm. principle as well? And obviously you mentioned Jesus affirming the principle of tithing. Both of those things can ultimately frame how we then read um, about these practices and principles in the Old Testament, can't they? And I mean, I don't know, uh, you know, I, I think for me, when I think of the practice of tithing, I, I almost think in a sense that even if from a uh from a a specific uh perspective if tithing wasn't something that was a command for us as believers for me i've i mean my conviction is i think it's it is a good thing Mm -hmm. for us to do as christians but even if it wasn't i think it's something that would be a really helpful practice because the new testament it talks about generosity Mm -hmm. really in a sense that goes above and beyond the old testament and so if anything the tithe it shouldn't be the ceiling of our giving but it's really the springboard isn't it love that it's kind of like you know saying you know i want to live um if i want to be generous but i'm not going to tithe it's like saying i want to live a prayerful life but i'm not going to pray in, mm. in, in the morning at yeah. all it doesn't quite add up and we read as well that god owns everything mm. you know, yeah. on a thousand hills yeah. uh, and we only give as the scripture says mm. we only give from what he's already given us right and so in a sense it's not i mean god's it's not that he needs, you know, he's not going to say, oh dear, you know, they're, right. not, they're not tithing, what am I going to do? Exactly. Um, it's a blessing for us to be able to give to God mm. as an expression of worship, an expression of love. That's wonderful. That's wonderful. And that's really, really helpful. We pray that this has uh, blessed you. And uh, hey, that's Nehemiah chapter, chapter 10. Do join us next time as we'll look at chapter 11. <laughs>